morning, brothers and sisters in Christ, and welcome to the digital worship service for Southminster Church for Sunday, December 13th, 2020. We are so glad that you are here to worship with us this morning. As we prepare our hearts and minds for worship, let me just remind you of a few things that are happening in the life of our congregation. I want to remind you that our Christmas store is open. If you're looking for an alternative gift for someone in your life, we call it the gift that gives twice. You can make a contribution to one of our mission partners that are making an impact around the world in honor of someone. You can stop by the church and pick up a little card as well as a little uh, description of that ministry and what it's doing and make your contribution and then send them that card that lets them know that a gift has been given in their honor, a gift that will honor them and bless someone in the world. We'd love for you to visit that Christmas store and uh, take part in that opportunity to be a blessing around the world. Uh, we are also continuing our clothing drive uh, for a local shelter and uh, any clothes, especially warm or cold weather clothes that you might have that are available, we're inviting you to bring it to the church. We will collect them and then pass it along. Uh, thank you so much for your participation in that. I, I want to remind you about a very special offering for our community and congregation coming up this Friday, December 18th and Sunday, December 20th from 530 to 7. We will be offering a drive through nativity, a very special way to celebrate the story of Christmas with our congregation and community. Uh, we would love for you to come and be a part of that and join us in that celebration and see the drive through nativity. Also, if you're interested in being a part of it, there's still some setup needs and there's a few supplies in the email that went out this week, our newsletter that I'll refresh in this email. If you have any of those that, that can be used, uh, we would greatly appreciate it. We are also continuing a Bible study as we go through Advent, looking at these Advent themes, love, peace, hope, and joy, these gifts of Christmas that Christ offers to us and how we can experience them in their fullness. We are meeting online at one o'clock and 6.30. The Zoom links can be found in our weekly newsletters. We would love for you to join us for that. And uh, we greatly, uh, we, we extend that invitation. We'd love to have you join us in that Bible study. Well, there are many things going on in the life of our church, and I want to invite you to continue to keep up to date on our newsletter. We welcome you to our digital service, remind you we have various ways to worship right now. We will continue this digital worship option. We also have an indoor service at 930 with many so safety protocols in place. Uh, that service is live streamed on our YouTube channel uh, that is led by our praise team. We also have an outdoor service at 1030. Uh, Folks can come, sit in their vehicles, listen to the service on their FM radio 90.5, or bring a chair and sit out right outside their vehicle. Um, but we, we would love for you to worship with us however you can and however you're most comfortable in this time. But we are glad that you are here this morning for worship. And let me call us to worship on this third Sunday of Advent, the Sunday where we place a special emphasis and focus on the joy that Christ offers us in his incarnation and in his coming. We've lit the third candle on the Advent wreath. The candle represents the light of joy, the joy that Jesus brings, the joy that Jesus offers. And let me call us to worship on this special day with these words from Philippians chapter four, uh, verses four and five. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. I'm struck by the Apostle Paul's words in this text, rejoice always. We're, we're gonna get into that a little deeper today about having joy always, in all times. Paul doesn't put any qualifiers on that about the situations and settings where we can experience joy and the ones where we're exempt, we don't need to have joy. He says, rejoice always. I will say it again. He is placing evident e emphasis that Christians should be a people of joy. And so welcome. I hope you are feeling joy today, or at least in this service, I hope we think a little deeper about what joy is and the joy that is offered to us. Welcome to worship. Let us pray together. 
Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for the gift of this day and for this time of worship. Thank you for my brothers and sisters in Christ who are joining this morning. Thank you for this provision of technology that allows us to worship even in this unique season. God, I pray that as we are gathered for worship, that your presence would be evident among us, that we would feel your spirit in our midst, that we would know that we are in the presence of you and that we would feel connected, even though we're separated, we would feel connected to the body of Christ. And Lord, I just pray your blessing on each household that's tuning in. I pray that you would just put aside distractions. It's so easy to be distracted in this time of worship uh, when we're not together. And so I just pray that you would put aside those distractions, help your word for us to be evident and clear and, and without interruption, Lord. We just pray that blessing and protection. And Lord, most of all, we pray that you use this time for your purposes in us. Take it, melt it, mold it, shape us to be who you have called and created us to be. Help us to see your word and your truth and your will in a new light. And help us to live in obedience as we go forward from this place. And we pray all these things in the powerful and mighty name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Friends, welcome to worship.
This morning, as we continue our Advent journey, we're going to talk about the topic of joy, the joy that Jesus offers us in his coming to earth. I think we all want to be joyful people. We certainly want to experience joy, peace, happiness. But what exactly does that mean? That's what we're going to talk about this morning. How, what it means, what is joy, what is Christian joy, and how can we experience it in all times, in all situations. I want to look at the second chapter of Luke, this beloved and well-known Christian story. So I invite you to join me or listen to these words from Luke chapter 2. It says, in those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. This was the first census that took place while Quirinius was governor of Syria. And everyone went to their own town to register. So Joseph also went up from Nazareth to Galilee from Nazareth in Galilee to Judea to Bethlehem to the town of David because Joseph belonged to the house and line of David. He went there to register with Mary who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born. She gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger because there was no guest room available for them. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them. And the shepherds were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. And this will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. Now I want to examine a few observations this morning, not about this story specifically, certainly a story that we are familiar with and and, uh, accustomed to referencing at this time of year, but specifically about the topic of joy. Because the angels say to the shepherds in their announcement of the arrival of, of Jesus, the birth of the Messiah, they say, we bring you good news of great joy for all people. But let's consider that announcement. Let's consider that promise for a minute. And let's look at the scene here. You will find a child wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. And we know they're here because there's no room for them in the end. Let's just stop there for a moment. Let's be honest. What is it about this Christmas scene that would induce joy? I'm not trying to be disrespectful or sacrilegious, but but let's be honest with each other. As the the shepherds uh, apparently run to the stable, run to this place where they've been told about this scene and this setting, They, they run in, they see a young woman, likely in her mid to late teens, which is very common in her day and age and in her context. She's engaged, but not yet married. She's scared. She's giving birth in this place. Not even the the one star, not even the half star, not even the roach coaches in Bethlehem have a room available. There's a, a young father there. He's, he's recently decided not to divorce this woman or, or break their engagement, which would be a, a more equal parallel in our day and age. We have this child who is born in a barn stable area. We don't have the specifics. We know it is a place that is commonly used for animals and livestock. What is it about this scene that would make the shepherds go, the angels were right, look around, what great news, what a, what a great situation, what great joy. Oh, by the way, this young family are miles from their home, they're traveling, they're uh, likely desperate, they don't know yet when they'll be able to return home or how they'll get back home. They don't even know yet about a political threat, a death threat that will be on their lives in a a matter of time. What is it about this situation in this setting that would cause the shepherds to go, wow, the angels were spot on. Look at this. Good news. Great joy. What What a great situation this is. I'm going to be honest, I have people come into the office from time to time. They come into the church and they're seeking assistance. Maybe it's a a young woman in a a difficult situation. Maybe she's 
recently had a baby, maybe she's separated from extended family or not near home or, or needs a little help or assistance or is sensing some danger, maybe there's some marital conflict. All of these things that are happening, and, 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 and I'm not saying that Mary and Joseph had marital conflict, but we, we know that he was convinced by the angel not to divorce her or break the engagement when he found out she was pregnant. But if, if we put this situation and this setting of what's happening with Mary and Joseph in a, a current context, if, if this story came into my office, somebody coming into the church seeking assistance, you know, an unexpected pregnancy, a, a, a marriage situation, separated from home, got to get back home, uh, a, a potential danger. If, if this came to my office, could you imagine me walking in and hearing the story of this scared young couple and, and saying, oh, that is good news of great joy? No. If, if, if we had this situation in our modern day, we would not respond, what great joy, what a great situation, what a, a healthy uh, situation for a baby to be born. What a, you know, a, a baby that's born out in a, a field somewhere or in a, a, a woodshed. I mean, <laughs> we would not look at that and say, what a great situation, what great joy. What is it about this story? What is it about this scene that the shepherds run to that should cause them to say, what a great thing that has happened. Let me suggest that there's only one thing about this situation and scenario, this setting that should cause great joy. And that's the promise that is found in this moment. The pronouncement of the angels. Today in the town of David, a savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah the Lord. Now, while we know that Jesus was born on this night and, and, and he is the fulfillment of promise, the good news doesn't start. The shepherds, their, their conflict and their hardships as, you know, hardworking people in the first century who are under Roman occupation, it's, it's not because Jesus is born that suddenly their, their situation and their, their context becomes better, that their lives are suddenly filled with joy. Even the arrival of Jesus, his birth, does not bring this onslaught or this oncoming surge of joy-inducing situations and circumstances doesn't relieve all their stress or all the hardships or all the struggle that they're facing. But it's in Jesus that the promise of God is found. And I'm going to suggest to you that as Christians, our joy doesn't come from our circumstance. Our joy comes from the unwavering promise of God. The coming of the Messiah was the beginning of God's promise that he would redeem and reconcile the world. He would fix the issue of sin that was introduced to the world in the Garden of Eden. And Jesus coming to earth, this baby being born, let's be honest, it didn't really change the circumstance of the people that were there. The shepherds didn't automatically have a better life just because Jesus was born but it was the beginning of the fulfillment of God's promise. God bringing resolution to the situation in the world, the, the struggles, the hardships that the people were facing. And you know what, this isn't new. In fact, if we go back and turn through the pages of scripture, we see the story of Abraham. God says to Abraham, I want you to get up from this place where you are, this place where you've lived, this, this land that you've cultivated and your family has toiled and, and prepared and turned over. And, and now that you've you know, created a living for yourself and made a homestead and you have a, a large family and I want you to leave this place your source of income, your source of protection, your source of familiarity, your source of comfort. I want you to leave this place. I want you to move and go to somewhere you've never seen before. Where's the joy for Abraham? It's not in the moment. It's not in his circumstance. It's not in his setting. Where is the joy? The joy is in the promise. When you get to the promised land, 
have great joy, good news for great joy, a great opportunity for you. See, for Abraham, the joy wasn't in his situation. The joy was in the promise that was extended to him. We can continue going through the, the pages of Scripture. <clears throat> we get to the story of Noah. Think of what the Lord asked Noah to do. I want you to take, undertake one of the most significant construction prog- pro- uh, projects in the, in the known world. This massive project. When we, when we read the, the size and the scale of the ark and consider the, the primitive resources and tools available to Noah, I mean, do we really comprehend what a massive undertaking God was asking of Noah? And, and not just the, the work and the labor that was before him and the years that it took for Noah to, to build the ark and the, the ridicule that he received as he, as he did it, as, as the, his neighbors and friends mocked. And, and then the, the collection and maintenance and, and care for the animals and then to, to spend a year in, in the boat in this ark. Wait a minute, pastor, I thought it said that it was 40 days. No, the the Bible says it rained for 40 days. Noah and his family endure the ark situation for a year. They spend a long time. Where is the joy in their circumstance? In the years of preparation and building and work and the, the year that they're closed into the ark as the waters rise and the flood ravages over the earth, where is the joy in that? The joy is not in their circumstance, not in their moment. It's in the promise of their protection. It's in the promise of their deliverance. It's in the promise of what is coming after the flood. What about the story of Moses? God says to Moses, I want you to go into the office, the the temple court, even more than an office, a a public place. I want you to go into the court of the most powerful person in the known world, and I want you to make a threat right to their face. You better let my people go. My people, your workforce, your, your slave labor, the ones who are building your country, I want you to tell that most powerful person in the world that you're going to take their, their workforce, and if, and if they don't let you and the people go, then bad things are going to happen. And then I want you, Moses, I want you to lead those grumbling, ungrateful, saved, rescued people through the wilderness for 40 years where's the joy for Moses there's no joy in his situation in his circumstance the joy for Moses is in the promise of what's to come or Gideon one of my favorite stories this is this is becoming one of my uh, favorite stories in Scripture, and our Wednesday Bible study has come across it a couple times, just, just looking at its significance in the Bible. Do you remember the story of Gideon? Gideon's called to go to battle to defend uh, Israel from the Midianites, one of the most daunting you know, military threats that the, the Israelites see. Uh, at the beginning of the story, uh, Gideon's army is significantly smaller than the Midianite army, and God is preparing preparing Gideon to lead his army into battle, and he tells them, the first thing I want you to do is um, <clears throat> tell your, your soldiers, anybody who wants to go home can go home, and a, a significant portion of the army just leaves. Um, Then he says, go down to the river, and I want you to have everybody take a drink. The soldiers that, you know, cup their hands, keep them. The soldiers that put their face in the water, um, you know, let them go. Uh, God keeps whittling Gideon's army, Gideon's outmatched army, down and down until finally they're outnumbered like a, a thousand to one as they get ready to go back into battle with the Midianites. And then to make it even worse, before the battle, God says, here's what I want you to take into battle, horns and clay jars and torches, which means no spears, no swords, nothing. So Gideon is leading his army into battle against the daunting Midianites, and they don't even have weapons, and they're outnumbered significantly. Where is the joy? Imagine the fear and anxiety that would be be welling up in in Gideon as he prepares for battle. Where is the joy for Gideon? Friends, the joy for Gideon is not in the moment, not in his 
context or his setting or situation, the joy for Gideon is in the promise of what's to come. But the story doesn't stop there. I mean, we can again go to uh, Levi, who's got a good job. Yeah, he's working for the, the Romans and his, his people are uh, frustrated that he has betrayed them as an Israelite, a Levite, <laughs> one who was born into the, the priestly line instead of leading the people in religious ways. He's working for the Romans and collecting taxes on his own people. Yeah, the, he was divided from his people, but hey, he had a good job in a very difficult and desperate economy. Or, or James and John, who were in the boat with their father. Or even the apostle Paul, Saul, who's you know, got a powerful and prominent position. What about any of these individuals that are going about their day-to-day -day lives and, and, and Jesus calls them? I want you to, to leave all that. Any normalcy, any comfort, any, uh, any, any common life that you have, your, your family, your households, you know, your, your routines, I want you to leave all that and I want you to follow me. <laughs> and he didn't say, here's your, here's your starting salary, here's your 401k, here's your residence, here's your auto allowance, here's your uh, benefits package. He, did, he didn't offer any of that. He just said, just follow me. Come with me. Where's the potential joy? There's, there's no joy in that decision. The joy comes in the promise that if you follow him, good things are going to come. What does this mean for us as Christians? Where do we find our joy? If our circumstances are difficult, if the news we receive is bad, if our hurts, our heartaches are on the rise, do we lose our joy? Is our joy based on our circumstance or is our joy rooted in the promise that we have? Author Leo Bascalia tells a story of what was known in his family as the misery dinner. It happened on a night where his um, father came home and told the family that they were likely headed for bankruptcy. His father was a, a lawyer and the partner in his firm had left and taken all, robbed the firm of all of their resources. They were on the verge of bankruptcy. And Leo's mother went out and did something in that moment that would probably be considered scandalous. She sold some of her jewelry and she prepared a feast. In a moment when the family was probably expecting to transition very quickly to peanut butter and jellies or soup or some other, you know, scrape it together, be ready for rations meals, Leo's mother prepared a great feast of their favorite foods. And while they all sat together and um, were a little confused about the what this feast meant, Leo's mother taught them an important story, an important lesson, that their joy would not be based on the moment that they were in, the news, the latest news that they received, or the fears that they had about their context, but their joy would be in an unwavering promise. And she said to them, now is the time where we need to celebrate and give thanks the most. So even in that fear-inducing, joy-stealing potential situation, that family decided to celebrate. Brothers and sisters in Christ, I want to encourage you to do the same. Certainly we are moving through a season of life that could steal our joy. We are isolated, we are separated, we are missing each other. We've got about 50% of our congregation that is worshiping online that hasn't been near many people in nine months now. This has been a long time. We've got another small portion that worships indoors, we've got another small portion that worships outdoors, but. But nobody is shaking hands and hugging and passing the peace and, and gathering at uh, potlucks or visiting each other in the hospital or, or all of those things that we are accustomed to as a congregation. 
Our kids are missing out on, on so many aspects of their normal life and their athletics and their you know, activities and their events and, and so many things that we look forward to and we're accustomed to. We've, we've gone through Thanksgiving with a lot of you know, different rules and regulations. We're heading into Christmas with some different expectations. There's a lot of things right now that are trying to steal our joy. But let's remember from the very beginning stories in Scripture and all the way through, for Christians, for the people of God, from the Old Testament to the New Testament, our joy was never supposed to be found in our circumstance. Our joy is found in the promise of God, the unwavering goodness and glory of our Heavenly Father. And in Christ, the good news of great joy that the angels bring is that today in the city of David, a Savior is born. He is the Messiah, the one who will save the world. And his life introduces us to a glorious promise beyond anything we could imagine. And so as Christians, our joy is not in our circumstance, not in our situation, but in the promise that we have, the unwavering promise of God, that God will fix and God will redeem and God will rescue. And that promise cannot and will not be broken. And so today, let's be people of great joy. Despite our circumstance, despite our temptation to be discouraged or defeated, let's remember the promise of God. God is going to fix it all, one way or another. God has got this in the palm of his hands. Let that be good news that brings us great joy. Amen.
And now, brothers and sisters, as we go out into the world, may you be filled with joy no matter what comes your way. And as you go, may the grace, mercy, and peace which comes from God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit be upon you this day and every day forevermore. Amen. Have a blessed week.